have two scripture lessons this morning. The first is from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, page 60. In your pew Bible, if you'd like to read along, I'll be reading that. And then Thomas Brewer is going to read Philippians for us. Let's listen to God's holy word. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Thank you, Thomas. Great job. Thank you, Thomas. Well, for the past couple of months, we've been walking with Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, and now we're going to be going into the wilderness. We are dipping our toes into the book of Exodus and into Paul's letter to the Philippians. Our first scripture finds us with Moses and the Israelites, who he has led out of Egypt when they were slaves, treated horribly by Pharaoh and all of Pharaoh's men, Anyone here remember the movie, The Ten Commandments? Anyone ever seen it? Oh, you can raise your hand. And who played Moses? <coughs> Charlton Heston. So, remembering that movie, if you read the book, the conditions that the Israelites, the Jews were under were horrible. So, Moses, who will always be Charlton Heston in my mind, <laughs> was tapped by God to get his people out of there, get God's people out of there. And Moses says to Pharaoh those great words, what are they? Let my people go. That's right. And after many plagues are released upon the Egyptian people, Pharaoh finally says, fine, you can go. Really, that's what it says in the Bible. You can look it up. Fine, you can go. So Charlton Heston, Moses, 
leads the people to the Red Sea. And when they look back, they see the Egyptian army following them, coming after them. The Israelites are in a panic. And what does Moses do? Takes his staff, raises it, parts the Red Sea. The Israelites run through, still in a panic, because those walls of water are pretty high and threatening. And when they get to the other side, they are safe. And they are free. I came across a a little story about Moses. It's actually kind of a joke um, that I'd like to share with you. And then I promise this will be the last joke that I I tell in a week or two. So, (laughs) Moses and Jesus were in a threesome playing golf one day. Moses pulls up the tee, pulls up to the tee, and he drives a long one. The ball lands on the fairway and then starts rolling directly towards a water hazard, a pond. Quickly, Moses raises his club, the water parts, (laughs) rolls to the other side, safe and sound. Jesus strolls up to the tee and he hits a nice long one right toward the same water hazard. It lands in the center of the pond and and kind of hovers there. So, (laughs) Jesus casually walks onto the pond, chips the ball onto the green. The third guy gets up, randomly whacks the ball, and it soars over a fence and into oncoming traffic. It bounces off a truck, hits a nearby tree. From there, it bounces onto the roof of a shack, starts to roll into the gutter, across the gutter, down the the drain spout, out onto the fairway and starts heading right for that pond. On the way to the pond, the ball hits a stone and bounces and lands gently on a lily pad. (laughs) Suddenly, a large bullfrog jumps up, grabs the ball (laughs) in its mouth, and as it is about to jump away into the water, an eagle flies out of the sky. (laughs) This is a true story I heard. Grabs the... Grabs the bullfrog, starts to soar as it passes over the green. The frog squeals with fright, drops the ball, which bounces right into the cup for a hole in one. (laughs) Moses turns to Jesus and says, I hate playing with your dad. (laughs) That's a good one, isn't it? the story. (laughs) When Moses and the Israelites had crossed over to the Red Sea, you'd think that that would be the happy ending after all that they'd been through. They deserve a happy ending, truly. But did you ever notice that life doesn't work that way? That you get through one obstacle and one crisis and you think you're fine and then before you know it, another one comes along. So here they are in the wilderness. Moses has been given the task of leading them to the promised land, the land of milk and honey. Does anyone know how long they wandered for in the wilderness? Forty years. I wonder... If they had known it was going to take 40 years, if they ever would have gone. Off they go. And before they get too far, things begin to go badly, as they often do. In chapter 16, right before the verses we read, the Israelites are hungry. And they're scared. So they start complaining to Moses. And they say things like, why did you lead us here? We're all going to die. It would have been better to have been slaves in Egypt because the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. I am sure that's in the Bible somewhere. So Moses talks to God, and God sends manna, rains bread down from heaven, and the people, the Israelites, are fed. They are taken care of. And now... They are continuing their trek in our reading through the wilderness. And they've been fine for a while. But now they're thirsty. And they're scared again. And they're complaining to Moses again. 
Why did you lead us here? Are you trying to kill us? So Moses speaks to God and says, These people, they're going to kill me. What do I do? And God says, Take your staff, the one that you parted the waters with, and go strike that rock over there, and water will come out of it. And Moses does, and for the time being, the people are fine. This story tells us three things. You can write them down if you want, but you don't have to. The first is that God will provide. God gives us what we need. God will take care of us. It may not always be in ways we expect. Who expected water from a rock? It may not always be in ways that we like or even want. Who wants to wander through the wilderness even for a day? I know I don't. But still, God will provide. The second thing is that we will forget that God will provide. It's human nature. Like the Israelites, God acts in our lives, providing for us, meeting our needs, caring for us in times of crisis. And we know this. Deep inside, we know this. Either because we've experienced it ourselves or if we've seen it happen in someone else's life. And yet the next time we find ourselves in a crisis, we will forget that just last week when we had that other crisis, God was there. And that's why we gather each week on Sunday morning to remind ourselves and each other that God will show up, that we will be okay. This is God's promise. And you wondered what you were doing here today. It's to remember that God is with you. The third thing is, it's often when things are darkest, when we are deep in the wilderness, whatever that wilderness is for you, when we are at the end of our rope, it is then that we have to take a risk and trust that God is there. Moses was lost in the wilderness. People were complaining, scared to death, and it's a good bet he was nervous too. Where were they going? When would they get there? And would the people kill him before they did? And why would God tell him to strike a rock for water? That's not how it works. And what if he struck a rock and nothing happened? What would the Israelites do then? But Moses took that risk. He trusted. And that made all the difference for him and for the Israelites. That's what Jesus did when he humbled himself and became obedient, even to death on a cross, says the Apostle Paul. And you know that for Jesus it was a lonely road. It was an awful road, and there were times that he was nervous and scared. Like when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed to God, please, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But then he took a risk trusted God and walked forward and died for us and was given new life. And that made all the difference for him and for us. It's when things are darkest and we are deep in the wilderness that sometimes we have to take a risk and trust that God is there. Chances are there is something out there, something going on in your life that might require you to take a risk, to take a leap of faith, to do what needs to be done, to do what you think God is asking you to do. And if there isn't, aren't you lucky? But for the rest of us, chances are there's something out there coming our way, not today, maybe tomorrow, later on in the month, it may not be getting water from a rock or walking to the cross. Maybe it has to do with a relationship, a job, a person. Maybe it's a project or a commitment you're considering. Or maybe it's as simple and as hard as simply getting up 
out of bed each morning when you're not sure you can. Whatever it is, know in your heart that when you take that risk, God will be with you, giving you what you need. Maybe from someplace unexpected. Just trust that God is there, because God is, and that's a promise. I want to leave you with this great quote that I found on a clergy blog. Let your faith be bigger than your fear in all things. Let's pray. Dear God, when we are struggling, when we are scared, when we are afraid, increase, strengthen, give us our faith. Give us the faith we need to do the things that you would have us do. And help us above all things to trust that as we do, you are there. Amen. Our next hymn, our last hymn, is in the new